thank you so much for having the time to sit down with us. It is my pleasure. Absolutely. As you talk, I'm wondering who he's talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about you because you really have, in this industry, laid some groundwork down, Chuck, as a musician that has been unmatched from anybody else and what you've done and who you've played with and the music you've done. Tell me about the beginnings. Where did it all start for you as far as how did music start to step into your life? Well, I was kind of born into music. Um, I was born into a Pentecostal church family, family church. And uh, from a very, very young age, I was always around hearing, uh, I would say now, amateur people, untrained people sing and play instruments, sing music, uh, sing and play, you know, instruments that yeah. they were not professional at. So the feeling of when the music is very slow, it's really slow, but very, very emotional. And when it's very, very fast, it's also very emotional. So I started out mainly coming up in the church family. Interesting. So at, at that particular point, were you listening to music? Were, you, were, were there records that you, you checked well, out? Or we were in or? church all day, every day. Oh, really? So it was, it was that. Well, you know, you, when you say untrained professionals, what I know of the church and, and, and gospel singers, mm. there is some serious talent yeah. that is unmatched in our industry mm. and raw. You know, really, really, really emotional and really honest. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing, you know, like that's what I mean by people who are not trained to sing or play an instrument, but they all, all my family members uh, basically played an instrument, especially the generation before me. Mm -hmm. um, they played and they just sang. Uh, I put that in the mix when I'm talking about it, unprofessional in that they didn't go to school to learn how to play or learn how to sing. It was all just a natural thing of singing and playing and rhythm, which was very, very important with me, especially with up-tempo up music, the rhythm of it. As I got older and around 16 years old, I was in the drum corps, played, field, you know, played uh, snare drum, field snare. Interesting. And um, that was also rhythmic for me. And I, I play the bass like it's a like it's a drum. Really, I'm thinking of more of a melodic drum when I do play the bass. Yeah, I'm playing drums. Yeah, you know. So I've had a lot of. of um, uh, I was in a doo wop singing group back in my hometown, where I, I wasn't really ever a true bass, but I played the same baritone, and where I was the bass singer in in that group. So music has always been a very, very important part of my life. We had a piano in the house coming up. My mother played piano, my sister played piano, and so did my father. Uh, although they did not do it professionally, but they were good piano players. Interesting. Uh, I played a little bit of piano. As a matter of fact, everybody in my, in my um, uh, close-knit family a much better piano player than I was. And for some reason, I was just more of an instrumentalist. Mm. I played the viola, I played the guitar, I played a lot of instruments. So it came up, my mother used to tell me that when I was a baby, she'd keep me quiet by putting on music. Because I would just get quiet just to listen to music. Mm. So I come from a musical family, both sides of my family, my mother and my father, they all sang or played an instrument. Well, were there any recordings of, of artists or bands that you listened to in the early days when you were younger? The first record I remember was uh, a record by Mario Alonzo called Be My Love. Mario Alonzo. Well, there's a name that was really a... a I remember it was, a, it was, yeah. a, it was a, an orange or a dark red 45 that they used to play. Be My Love. Yeah. It was a, yeah, a big song. I used to listen to that a whole lot. You know, yeah. It was one of my earlier... Of course, my father played pieces like Clarity Loom in certain places like that where I would hear the piano because we had, like I said, we had a piano in the house. Mm. But music was always very interesting. It kept me quiet. It made me dream. Yeah. I'm a, definitely a dreamer. <laughs> I've dreamt every time I go to sleep. If I went to sleep now, I would dream. <laughs> yeah. How did you learn? Did, 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 you, did you take lessons? Was it, was it just from your family? How did you learn your instrument? Uh, the bass? Yeah, the bass guitar. Uh, the bass I picked up on my own because I played guitar. Played guitar first. Before I played the bass. Right. But of course I uh, was the trumpet player originally, playing marches and classical music and stuff like so, that. I mean, so piano was in your family, you played some drums, Yeah. you got involved with trumpet and guitar. But the viola was before trumpet. And viola. Yeah. <laughs> An orchestra. That's really, you were your own orchestra for sure. <laughs> 
Uh, they put me on trumpet because I lost two school violins, so uh, the field was <laughs> in my neighborhood. It wasn't cool to play the viola or the violin, uh, but I didn't care for it that much. Uh, I don't think I did, but it was the sound of music because it's in that contralto area, mm. baritone contralto, contralto area that uh, I later gained when I was in college, when I went to play baritone horn in the mm. brass ensemble. Uh, so with the bass, I taught myself how to play it in that it's a very simple instrument, I think, to understand. It's the easiest instrument in the orchestra to play. <laughs> the traditional bass, four strings, everything you play is in a form, you know, everything past the fifth position is in the treble clef. So the bass was relative, you know, re relatively very easy for me to play. And were there bass guitar players, I heard you mention earlier, bass guitar players that you listened to that really kind of like began to open your mind to see the potential? They were all upright bass players, I'm sure, yeah. before then. And you mentioned like George DeVivia, who I had met many years ago through a dear mentor of mine, Louis Belson, who had worked with George for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And George is just the sweetest, nicest guy. Very nice man. And, but a phenomenal player. One thing about George that was very special was in, in our business, a lot of people aren't kind. There are a lot of, of the older guys, the generation before me, that were the sort of kind of rude. Although you look at the rudeness as being just a part of their personality or character. But George was like my Uncle Raymond. They were very kind to young people coming up. Very, very kind. Uh, sometimes when you get kindness, you really learn better. Or you get it quicker. And George was very, very kind to me. You know, like, as a matter of fact, he's the one that pushed me to write a book. Yeah. Uh, he said, you should write a book. And so, of course, I wondered why um, at that particular time. Because I was playing a little different than the average electric bass player. Hmm. And I also was playing jazz, you know, and I met George when I was doing sessions. And w were you playing upright at all? Or you playing no, no. I was playing electric bass. All electric bass, right. Hey. And... Um, George, in that day, was one of the kind, upright players who did not resent the electric bass. He didn't play it. No, he didn't play it. He didn't resent it. That's a powerful line. Uh, well, a lot of the upright players, when I first started playing, because I was, uh, at my age, I was one of the very few players, or at the very beginning of playing an electric bass. Right. Which they saw was a bass guitar. Right. And it's not a bass guitar, it's an electric bass. Yeah. Uh, four strings, like, you know, like, like the uh, upright bass is. And George and Milt and Richard Davis, they were very, very kind to me in New York. And that most of the other players were very either jealous or they did not like the instrument because they couldn't play it. And there was a big difference in playing the upright as opposed to playing the electric bass. Hmm. Um, it's the same, it was, the look is different. But still, if you're a bass violin player and you know, all of a sudden now you see guys playing a little skinny bass, a lot of them had um, a bit jealous uh, <laughs> because I was working a lot and also playing the role that they played, except I was playing in the electric place yeah. and getting paid a little extra because it was called a miscellaneous instrument. And that, as a matter of fact, it's still that way in the union. When they call for a bass player, they're talking about the bass violin. If you bring an electric bass, it's like a double. You oh, get paid more because you you know, you get paid more because you have a miscellaneous instrument, of which I reap the benefit from because I didn't play the big one. So I'm coming with this miscellaneous instrument, so I get paid for the big one and a little extra because of this instrument. <laughs> you know, but George is very, very kind. George and Milton and Richard Davis in particular, very, who, very kind. Who else? O other names of guys that, that were there? Um, well, I remember basically, I know Mingus was spending a lot of time also in New York when yeah. I was... Uh, there in New York, although he's from the West Coast. Right. And uh, I have the distinction of my bass being the first electric bass that Charles Mingus played. Really? He came into the club and put it on a bar stool and had it upright. <laughs> <laughs> he, played, he played Sweet and Lovely. Uh, played the melody, took the solo. He played that one thing and he told me, wow, pretty interesting the first time I ever played one of these. And so we were friends from that day forward. How beautiful. You know, it is beautiful. But, but what, what a great musician, what a great composer he was. A lot of the young generation, they, they won't know who Mingus is. No, they won't. 
you know, even George de Vivier, these great players, Ray Brown, these guys who were Ornstead Pedersen, these guys were great, great players. How, how do you think, you, how do we get this younger generation to really understand these legends that inspired you? I kind of think that it, um, nowadays things are different. Mm -hmm. When I came up playing uh, the electric bass, I was basically playing um, uh, R&B, except my first professional gig outside of my hometown was with um, was playing um, uh, jazz with Big, uh, Big J. McNeely, who was a, a bebopper. Right. Where we just played rhythm changes. You know, as a matter of fact, I was still playing with my thumb in those days as a pick, but with Big J, I had to play with my fingers because of the, the speed and the tempos, yeah, sure, you know, so, sure. I, I, so I learned how to play with my fingers. How old are you around this time? Uh, at that time, I was 21. Interesting. 21. And playing jazz and bebop, and that was that was that the beginning part of you stepping into that world, or? Uh, that was the beginning part of stepping into that yeah. world, yeah, because I had been playing R&B yeah. before that. And what was it like now stepping into jazz? Because jazz is still the undiscovered genre you know here it is it's it's a it's an american based art form it's probably america's greatest export jazz music but yet now today if you want to hear great jazz music you got to go to europe you got to go to europe this is true and i travel the world and i'm constantly or japan and i'll play way more dates in jazz in europe than i will here in the states yeah. so so was that a were you listening to jazz at the time to kind of learn more about that? um at that time no it was a gig and for some reason, I was chosen or I was asked to play because the, the electric bass was, even then, in 1962, very, very new. Mm. And um, one thing, too, in my, where I'm from, I was the only person in town that had a, an electric bass. The only person. If there was another one, there was probably in a gospel choir, but not on the scene. So in Youngstown, Ohio, at that time, I'm the only person that has an electric bass. Boy, what a great way to be the best electric bass player in Ohio. Is to be, be the, the only, only one, one to own the instrument. <laughs> and even when I got to Cleveland, which was a real, actually my birthplace in Cleveland, uh, when I got to Cleveland, I was still, if not the only one, one maybe maybe one or two people that had an electric bass. Interesting, interesting. So uh, I got out of Cleveland by someone coming to town, wanted to replace whoever they had for whatever the reason was, they needed an electric bass player, and I'm the only one there. So, d did you learn? Did, did you learn? You know, did anybody teach you changes and scales? Did anybody sit down on the bass and talk to you about about the, the the core of the instrument, or was this on your own, just discovering it? Well, back in those days, um, I would say this: that most of the players, well, number one, very few people played my instrument. Hmm. Very few people did. So I had the 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 the, the electric bass and the guitar. Virtually the same thing. Right. Uh, the bass is the bottom four strings of the guitar in right. the bass clef, and if 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 you just pay attention to the bass, it's almost like the piano. Everything has a form to it. And uh, going through my college years, I found that the bass is the easiest instrument to understand. It has a roll. There's only four strings to it, tuned in fourths. If it, were, if it were tuned in fifths, it would be a different instrument. Yeah. But it's tuned, and here comes the bride, in fourths. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's easier to play and to learn if you just spend time with it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you spend time with the instrument, you gotta know what it does or what it doesn't do. And it has its form or what it is. So there was no one around really to teach me uh, how to physically play the instrument. I had to listen to records to find out how easy this is if you just find out if you can hear um, what scales are. Right, right. That's all jazz, uh, the jazz players, they're just playing scales. Well, um, on the Ionian mode, it's just playing scales and the naming the chord, uh, which I like, I did that in R&B. So when it came to playing Bob, it's more of this rhythm change. No, it's the same, just rhythm changes. Yeah. Um, which you hear other people play them on records, or you go to a live gig. It's the bass player in Youngstown. His name was Big Boogie D. That's what they call him, Big Boogie D. And Big Boogie D was popular, famous. 
you know, he played in a band with Hump Jones, a guy named Hump Jones. And Big Boogie D would have this big old bull bass and he was spinning. He was playing it. I was in the high school jazz band playing trumpet. I remember we had an affair one time where the jazz band played first and then Hump Jones, the pro, the trio they played. And me and a friend of mine were standing right next, right beside Big Boogie D. And Big was not playing no notes. It's just yeah, rhythm. And the ear is very, very sympathetic. If the bass player is playing good rhythm, the ear is going to hear the right note even though he's not playing the right note. <clears throat> Especially if it's in, in, a, uh, in an acoustic bass. Now with the electric bass, you do hear the notes, uh, but the rhythm is more important in the melodic sense of what's being played on the instrument. Um, if the song is in A flat, and the, uh, the fifth of A flat is uh, E flat. Um, so if you play an open E, and it's on the low string and you get rid of it real quick, the ear is going to hear E flat, although you played an E. <laughs> That's why you find a lot of the upright players, they ghost using open strings. You know, they just ghost the open strings and the ear hears the right note. Interesting. Um, so when it came to learning how to play the instrument, it's a very easy instrument to play if you if you're Destined to be a bass player, I guess. Hey, yeah, you say you say easy. You were destined to be a bass player, and it came easy to you. It sure as heck is not an easy instrument to learn because of the way you play all the different styles and artists that you've worked with. You fit in so well with everybody, and you blend in, and that's a part of just your general listening skills and your incredible talent at that. I uh, usually don't like to blow my own horn or anything, but you said something that's very important just now, listening. If you listen, especially, I mean, I've done a lot of uh, records, which is, you know, obvious. I've been involved in the recording industry very, very, a long, long time. And usually, half the dates that I did in Hollywood had a demo. Or if not a demo, they would have a chord chart. And if you play a whole lot, you fashion yourself to certain things that's hard to explain for someone else. When I look at a G chord, a G major, a G major seven chord on a music page, and I've been I already know what the rhythm is. Usually, a major chord suggests something that's slow, or suggests something that's easy going. So, if you've been given a tempo, you hear, you kind of feel that it's a major seven sound. If it says G seven, G dominant seven, then it's suggesting something maybe funkier or bluesier. So that in itself registers a certain kind of thought about what to play or what not to play. Uh, the same thing with open chords, like an A minor, a D minor chord, uh, or an E minor chord, or a major chord, dominant seventh. If it's, uh, if it's a dominant chord, uh, my mind automatically goes to something that's more, it's not a major feel. Am I making sense? Absolutely, absolutely. A dominant seventh chord suggests something bluesy, Pentecostal-y, I can say yeah, that. Sure, sure. Uh, funky. And so there's a certain thing not to do. I noticed in country music, uh, I found this to be a fact in a way. That when the bass walks up to a chord, the bass is walking up in a major sense. But coming down, they come down in a dominant sense. Interesting. And it sounds real corny to come down major. Or what major but come down dominant. In jazz it's that way also too. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that you, that, uh, that not only me but anybody should feel. If you listen to a lot of music and try and emulate what you hear, you'll find that there are certain rules that are not written. That's not, I mean, in school they certainly don't do it. Yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, I found a few people, like in, down in Louisiana, where you find that your uh, your professor does will say something like what I'm saying. But basically, in the system, they don't say what I'm saying because it's not theoretically correct. Like it's a it's a dominant. Say you again. It's like you're in the key of G, and the chord is basically a G 
seven chord. A G, what about what about a flat seven? It has a certain look. If it's funk or R and B, I could really play a B flat note. Whereas it should be theoretically correct to play a B note. But it's just a way some rules are you can't word this script when to break a rule. What you do is you can break a rule if you've had the experience of how to break it. Like for instance, there's a red light. You can go through the red light if ain't nobody looking. <laughs> or if there's no cop around. Or if there's no traffic. So there's a time to go through the red light and there's a time not to do it. And uh, it's hard to make a rule on when to do it and when not to do it. <laughs> you sort of have to have had experiences of what happens to you when you do it at the wrong time. And again, what's good on Monday with this group of people may not be good with the same group of people on Wednesday. You know, so it's a feeling thing. We started this by talking about listening. Yeah. A lot of people have come to me and tell me how fantastic I am, and I'm not really that fantastic. I just listen to what's going on. Because a lot of the ideas that I give from improvi of improvising a bass line or coming up with one, I hear that sucker. I hear it already being played. That's what makes you fantastic. That it's already being play played that. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. You know, in the music. But you, you hear that. That's, that's, that's to a certain degree a gift that you're able to hear. That's because <laughs> I'm in love. <laughs> I'm in love. I listen to it. I listen to it. You know, you, you mentioned that, um, that when you started playing like your bass and, and, and bass guitar, that you were learning from these acoustic guys that, that really did not play bass. Mm -hmm. How do you see the generation now that's up now, the guys like Victor Wooten or, or John Patitucci, these guys that are playing five and six string bass guitars now that have expanded the instrument. You mentioned fourths, how the bass is too now. Fourth, you mentioned Here Comes the Bride. That's that first fourth. Boom, bum, ba bum, boom, bum. That's bum, the fourth. And it goes all the way up, right. Mm -hmm. What do you think about these guys like Victor Wooten and John Patitucci, these guys that are breaking rules now with the instrument? Well, um, well, we can talk about two people, Victor and Christian McBride. Right. Now to me, when you look at Victor Wooten, Victor Wooten does play uh, the, uh, the acoustic bass also. He plays the cello. Uh, but when it comes to the electric bass, he does things that nobody can do. But he doesn't do it, he doesn't get paid to do it. He does it because he's just that kind of a uh, musician. Yeah. And so the way that he plays, the way that he thinks, when you look at Bela Fleck, a lot of their music is in different time signatures. Yeah. Now I'm a regular three, four, four, four kind of guy. When it comes to t tempos like, I mean, uh, signatures like seven, eight, five, four, I can deal with pretty good, but I gotta start thinking real hard yeah. when it comes to nine, eight, and seven, eight. And the way to count because it's not been my forte or what I do a lot of. Uh, of course, I can do it, but it is work. Not to say that playing four four is not work, but some things are a habit. So with a Victor, Victor is not a normal person uh, when it comes to playing the bass. He can play these things and hear it very, very clearly and execute it very, very clearly and very, very special. Christian McBride. Is one of those, uh, Chris McBride and Ralph Armstrong. Uh, right now, when I listen to these people play, I am so inspired to continue doing what I do. I can never do what they do. Number one, playing that instrument. I have one, but no one has ever offered me a dime to play it. <laughs> um, and I don't play it. I'm not that secure with it, you know, you know, to play it live. Unless it's a very slow ballad, then I'll try it then I, I can't play it because I do know how to play it that well. But when I see Christian McBride or Esperanza play the electric bass. Esperanza's bowling. You know, like, it's just amazing to me the, the command like Mingus had or Ray Brown had when they play the bass. So it's the command. They've done it so much that she can play without ever looking at her and Christian. They can play without even, even looking at the neck. They can talk, explain, and continue to play, which means they spend a lot of time playing that instrument, which is what I like. The time has been spent, yeah. and everything takes time. So when you mention Victor, you're talking out of the, he's very special. 
Yeah. Esperanza Christian, they're very, very special people. Yeah. And that when I hear them play or watch them play, I'm inspired to pick up my electric bass. Mm -hmm. And I play the six and the five also. You know, I, I, but I'm traditionally a four string player. And so I will play that by the way that I play it. I play the six almost like a uh, like a guitar, although it's strung in fourths, mm -hmm. you know. And I will uh, try not to play it too much, because again, it gets back to having too many, to having, having a wife and having some old ladies on the side. <laughs> you know, I don't work a lot, you know. <laughs> Uh, but the last record that I did, I did with the five string, so like I have to play the five because yeah. of the low B. You gotta get to the this one. And going back to these other people, you see James Jameson, by the way, yeah. proved to us all that if you have a technique and a style that fits across all boards, all genres, all genres, I don't mind saying this, but I sort of kind of play the same way. A lot of bass players play with too many notes, whereas I like to play a lot of rhythm on a few notes because I wish I were a drummer to begin with. <laughs> so I'm playing drums on my bass, and so a lot of notes, they get in the way of the guitar player, they get in the way of things. And so in taking a page from James Jameson, although I think that um, we both are sort of kind of the same, except that he had the luxury of playing with the same company on many, many, many hit records. I had the luxury of coming up in New York and playing on many, many record, uh, records. Except I'm playing the same technique, one, five, one. In the key of G, I'm playing G, D, G. Basically, one, five, one. And then maybe some little doodles and skips and bounces uh, throughout the chord, the, Ion the Ionian thought of what the theory is and that thing, but not playing too many notes where it fits over everything. Country music, one five one, boom, 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 boom. That's the same thing that happens in all pop music. It's the same thing that happens in reggae. It's the same thing. You listen to all the Motown stuff, you're going to hear one five one from James Jameson. Right. And maybe one three six every now and then to move around. Plus, he had the luxury, too, of playing with a drummer that was just basically playing. So everything that he played, you could really hear the bass line. Yeah. I had, again, another luxury of coming up with like of Gary Chester, Bernard Purdy, James Gadsden, when they're playing <laughs> a lot of nuances that gives me ideas yeah. for playing a bass rhythm because I'm hearing nuances. You know, but going back to Motown music, once I studied or had to learn the bass parts to all those hit records, number one, as I mentioned earlier, if you live in a climate that has four distinct serious seasons, you got to get yourself indoors <laughs> in the winter. So which means you have, to, you, you have to make money. And so Motown, they had, they had so many hit records, you had to learn those songs in order to make money or to compete. Because I go to a jam and they want to play, I was made to love and the bass player don't know song. <laughs> you know, so you worked, yeah. You know, but the thing is, you listen to the radio and they listen to all these songs, you know, to where um, I think your know, question was, I hope I'm answering. Well, you, you are, and we talk you know, about, about listening. I and mean, what's amazing about it is, well, we could talk for hours. I, 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 I love, you know, you know your, your, the depth of your experience that you have. In closing, what would you say to the next generation? What would you leave for the next generation to, to, to take with them students that are here at Media Tech that would that would you know, be inspired by all of this experience and this wisdom. I mean, it really is a wisdom that you have. Wisdom is the combination of knowledge and experience. Knowledge alone, information, does not give one wisdom. It's then putting that knowledge into action that creates the experience, which is where you are now. What would you leave with this next generation of what they can do to continue on with playing bass and or music in general? Well, I would say, basically, I've been really saying it all afternoon. If you don't love what you're doing, 
you don't have a problem. You don't have a problem because a lot of things that, has, that have happened to me, it doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter whether you're doing camera work or whether you're doing a video, uh, what you're doing. If you're an engineer, if you don't love to do it, all the things that don't happen the way they should happen, you're going to suffer. <laughs> you're going to get an ill feeling, you're going to get mad at the dog, you're mad at your car, you're going to... You know, you're not, you know, and it's, suffering is part of what we do as people. We're going to suffer if we don't have the right mindset. I talk this way, I don't mean to preach about it, but if you don't love it, the least little thing that goes wrong or negative, you're going to suffer because you have a feeling about that. If you love to do it, I've played songs, I've been in bands where... We played all night long. Now when it comes to get paid, either the leader runs off with the money, or he ate it all up, drunk it all up, or the club owner runs off with the money. Now we don't have any money. For me, if we play one song that night, one song that really turned me on, that's what's in my mind as I'm riding the train all night until a friend, a friend gets up and goes to work and I can stay in his bed to sleep. <laughs> but the thing about the, if you love the music, and I'll say this, I don't want to really be long-winded about it, but I'm 75 years old this year. And I can tell you, I can tell you for sure that if you really love something, the universe has always paid me back. I'm really in love with this. Now I've been married three times, I don't mind saying that. But I've been married twice to the same woman. But the thing is, I've gone through three marriages. And the thing about it is I'm still a very, very in touch with and very platonic friendship with my first wife. Now, I'm saying all this to say is that when you're in love, you're in love with a, a friend. Things are more wrong. You know, you're, the neck on your base can warp and you gotta get a new neck. It is what it is. You do it and press on with a smile. But if you really love something, the universe, some people can say, God, you can do whatever it is you want to say. I'm using universe to cover everybody's preference. The universe will pay your behind back if you love it and give attention to it. Nothing has a reaction until you give attention to it. Just looking at the instrument, well, no matter what you're doing in your career, just looking at it and having a peaceful smile about it you're going to get paid back. Now that's what has happened to me. And if it happened to me, you know, it's got to happen to everybody if you put attention where it should be. You know, I have no problem saying what I'm saying because I love music. I love what it does for me. I know what it does for me in my dreams. And I've been paid back many, many times by doing a gig for you for nothing because I want to play and then you come along and you want to, and you want me to play, but because I play for you for nothing, I didn't care. I probably needed the money, but I'm gonna do a better job for him. And because I work for you, and say you don't pay me, because I did that job with love for the music. When you hire me, you have benefited from me playing and being in love here, here, and here. Um, I think I'm old enough to say that, although it's kind of hard for younger people, people that have not had my experience to say it this way. But if you care enough about it and you love it, boy, are you going to get paid back. Now, as soon as you start BSing, we're told not to curse up here. <laughs> uh, um, I'll say this too about that. Not that I can say this. You can cut this out. <laughs> you can cut this out. <clears throat> Things that are a pain in the ass need to be expressed and felt that way because when you say, man, this is a pain in the butt, pain in the butt don't mean the same thing as pain in the ass. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it doesn't mean the same thing. Not that you have to say these things, but inside there is a difference. Some things you can sugarcoat, some things you can't sugarcoat. It is what it is. There are a lot of people that say, I don't come out the house unless it's $100. Well, that's that kind of a person. To me, I come out the house for nothing. I mean, I don't do it as much as I used to do it. <laughs> but the thing is that there are times that you need to play. You need to have an interaction. You need to have someone slap your hand. 
You need to be able to get along with people that you don't like. You need to be able to be put in situations with people that don't like you, whatever the reason is. You have to have that experience and it takes time. Everything takes time. It don't happen overnight. If you love it, it's like going to sleep at nine o'clock at night, the first thing you know is 6.30 in the morning. You don't remember nothing. <laughs> it's all gone by. It's all gone by because you love what you're doing. You're enjoying what you're doing. If you don't enjoy it, get another job, do something. Because this is not easy. Our business is not easy. It is not easy and what you have said is very powerful, very poignant and with great passion. Chuck, we thank you so much. On behalf of the sessions, you have been absolutely wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chuck Ramey. Thank you so much.